The message series for this month is titled Big Ideas. The idea behind the message series is, is fairly simple, actually. There are some big ideas in Christian faith. Those big ideas lead us to discover what God wants to do in us and how faith in Jesus Christ can change us little by little, day by day, as we seek to live better by faith. And so the intent each month, each week this month is for us to be able to discover how one of those big ideas of Christian faith can actually be a part of our everyday life, how we can think through those ideas and live them out every day of the week. First idea this morning is this, God is in the business of restoration. Now this should be good news. This is where in, in the old-fashioned church we'd be saying, amen, because you and I, if you don't know it yet, you and I are all created the same way. We're in need of God's restoration. We we may not have been intended to be this way, but it's turned out that all of us are in need of this restoration. And so I don't know where you were uh, in your spiritual life before you walked into this room, but I do know this. I have not been privileged yet to pastor a perfect human being. I'm reminded often that I am not in that category either. So what does that mean? That means God is working to restore us so that we can be the people we're meant to be. You know what that word restoration means, right? That's where something has gone from order to disorder, from purposeful existence to lacking function, going from having been one thing that was as it was intended to be, then falling into disrepair and being repaired. Any of those fit you? I know they do me. When I think about restoration, I think about a table like this, that you know, half of it is restored, half of it is not. That may be the perfect example of what it's like to be a follower of Christ. If you notice in the scripture, it says the people who were saying yes to God believed in Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit entered their life. It didn't say they suddenly got perfect. It said they suddenly had a unique connection to God. How much of your spiritual table has been restored? Half, three-fourths, 75%, 10%. Have no fear. God is never done with either any of us. God's always working to restore us. I think about down in in St. Louis in the the Grand uh, Avenue Arts District, there is this theater, the Sun Theater, and it used to look just like this. It used to be a beautiful place. But as you know, a lot of the central city of St. Louis has fallen over time into disrepair. But some folks have decided it's important to restore a lot of the the great areas of culture and of community in St. Louis. The Lawrence Group, an architecture and design group, took this project on, and this is what it looks like today. Isn't that amazing? So we could go there and go see a play or concert. I actually intend to do it uh, sometime soon. I, I need to get online and find out when it fits with my, you know, fairly boring schedule where I have nothing to do <laughs> between church and two kids. But that's beautiful. Can we go back, Holly, to the previous picture for just a second? I don't know if you can go. There you go. Look at that. Now, I want you to hear me really clearly. You and I without God, fall into disrepair just like this Sun Theater did. We do. We fall into disrepair spiritually. We lose our connection to God, lose our connection to who we're meant to be. We get distracted by the everyday realities of life. And those everyday realities are everything from I've got to mow the grass, I've got to dust the house, to really serious things like I or someone I love is ill, or I have bills to pay. And we lose track of God, even though God doesn't lose track of us. But God never gives up on us and calls us to a faith that begins to restore us. And we move from this to what the Sun Theater looks like today. Literally, that kind of dramatic restoration is what God is endeavoring to do in your life and in mine, in your neighbors, in your family members, in your friends, in those people you rub shoulders with at the grocery store in those online contacts you make through social media. Every one of us needs to move from disorder 
to restoration and order. God is in the business of restoration. So this morning, I hope you will open your hearts up and your minds up to what God wants to do in you, to what God is already doing in you. Begin to visualize how this is God's end product for your life spiritually. Can you, can you connect that metaphor to your real life every day? Second idea this morning is this. It turns out that we're all restoration projects for God. It's not an uh, idea I haven't already introduced, I know. But this is crucial. It turns out that we're all restoration projects for God. All of us are in need of the same God, the same help, the same hope. The scripture for this morning speaks about a group of people who recognize they need God's help. In fact, the scripture says that one man had this, this sense, the word of God come to him and said, send for someone who can actually help you, Simon Peter. Go get him. He's going to change your life and everyone who cares for you. This morning, I want you to hear this. Simon Peter, the witness that has been recorded in Scripture about what he did, is meant for you and me too. And we should be sending for the Spirit of God to, to come to our life and to those we love and to give us the life-changing facts we need to hear that Jesus Christ dies for us, is raised to new life, and that kind of resurrection hope can be part of our life every day. Believing in the Son of God leads us to a restoration we need. Are you ready for God to work in your life to continue restoring you? What are you willing to do? Are you willing to see God restore your neighbor's heart, your neighbor's spirit, that person in your family that you're praying for that needs God in their life. The scripture today says that God is in the, the work of restoring you and everyone you know. So let's stop for a second. If that mean, if it's true that every one of us is a restoration project, spiritually speaking, for God, what does that mean about us? It means that one of the things we need to be restored from is to realize so often we identify ourselves as better than. You know that table we just saw a minute ago? Half of it was restored, half of it wasn't. Can you imagine if that table was sitting next to a table that was fully unrestored? and could speak, and looked at the table next to it and said, you are a disgusting, unrestored table. I am fairly restored. You're disgusting. I don't want to be with you anymore. But I, I have some purpose now. I know it's a ridiculous thing, isn't it, to talk like that. But could it be just as ridiculous for us to look at someone else who doesn't act like we do, doesn't believe like you, doesn't look like us, and say to them, you are repugnant in my eyes. I wish not to be with you. I just can't stand you. Or if not to say it, to act it. I'm always shocked when we followers of Christ misunderstand where we are on the scale of restoration. And we think if we have said a good prayer, if we have attended enough church stuff, if we have understood how to talk right, or we've read enough of the Bible, Somehow that elevates us above others. The intention of God's restoration is for us to see ourselves not as people who have been given more worth than other people, but that because of our faith, we are called to be servants who place ourselves below others, just as Christ did for us. Restoration begins when we seek to serve others and allow others the same opportunity to encounter the God of restoration. So, third idea. Some, oh, I'm sorry. Let's go back to that. Oh, that was a good one. I forgot that scripture. It just reminds us of who we are. It's not in the scripture I read, I know, but it turns out it's in the Bible too, so we might as well look at it. Romans 3 reminds us of our actual condition. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. 
every once in a while I encounter a Christian who says, well, I've stopped sinning. Now, they say it to me usually when they are identifying someone else's sin. Usually it's mine. <laughs> why did you baptize that person? Uh, what, uh, why did you root for that team? <laughs> for all have sinned, fallen short of the glory of God. Each of us, in need of the same restoration, in need of the same reconnection to God. Okay, so third idea. Some spiritual restorations seem too impossible for God. Isn't this true? Some things just seem like they can't be done. That's an interesting take when our entire faith is is founded on the cornerstone belief that one person was fully divine and fully human, lived on this earth, was killed, then died, then was raised to life and didn't die again. That's the founding, that's the crux of the Christian faith about who Jesus is. So it's kind of interesting that Christians would have this in our minds. There are some things too too impossible even for God to do. But it's true. I mean, I, I understand this. You just look at some people and think, well, they're never going to believe. It is not happening with them, you know? You know what I'm talking about, don't you, right? There are just some things where you think, well, that's just not going to happen. The scripture speaks about it today. It's talking about how Simon Peter is being challenged at the very core of who he is. He has grown up with a religious conviction that he knows is true. That religious conviction comes from the scripture. Do you hear me? Have you ever had a religious conviction you know is true and you can find a place in the Bible that proves you're right? You hear me? Yeah, you got that, right? You know it's true, you're convicted of it. You see it in the Bible. Can't change, right? Let's go back to the Bible. It says, don't eat certain kinds of food and don't mix some stuff together. Cheeseburgers, not kosher. Pulled pork, not kosher. Simon Peter, the scripture for many Christians is so, they read so many times, don't even think about what's happening here. Simon Peter has never had a cheeseburger. He is not American. That's true, he is not an American. This was not written for America, by the way. This was written for Simon Peter. He, was, he had not had a cheeseburger. He had never had pulled pork. To imagine eating a medium rare steak was disgusting to him. To sit with someone else who ate any of those foods was impossible to imagine. He wouldn't even go to the house of someone who would do that because it would bring dishonor and shame to his name and his family's name and to the Christians who were all Jewish at this early stage in Christian faith. It was impossible for him to imagine that God could take a a medium rare steak, pulled pork, and a cheeseburger, the mixing of of hamburger and cheese, and make that okay. Do you understand what I'm saying here? Is God calling to your heart now to help you understand the scripture for the first time? Jesus is not like you and me at all, in that he changes us in ways we can't anticipate. Simon Peter's not like you and me, because he never ate like us. And so he has a vision that says to him, Your conviction is now wrong. It's a vision that says, I know what it says in the Bible, and guess what? It's time to change. There was another conviction. We won't speak about too much here today, but the ritual act that was a sign of God's covenant with the people of God, with the Jewish people, the ritual act of circumcision, was just as crucial to their identity as God's people, as anything else that they, that they did. It was a crucial part of being the people of God. And here, Simon Peter is challenged to see 
that God no longer says this has anything to do with being saved. And he cannot wrap his mind around it, and the other Christians can't either. It seems as if some spiritual restoration is impossible for God. Now, the whole problem is anyone who didn't believe in those crucial convictions of the Jewish faith were perceived to be outside of God's grace and the salvation Jesus Christ brings. It just seemed impossible that anyone who didn't buy into these things that Jews held to be true, that are in the scriptures. It just seemed like nobody could be saved who didn't just agree with the stuff that they'd always done. Some spiritual restoration seems impossible. What the scripture says to us is that God didn't give up on people who weren't Jews. Instead, through Jesus Christ, God made a way for all people to connect eternally to God's grace. Fourth idea is this, that God is not deterred by difficult projects, working miracles every day. If you are not of Jewish heritage, if you're not of Jewish heritage, if you can't go back 20 generations and find a connection to Jewish faith, or even one generation for that matter, and you find yourself connected to God through faith in Jesus Christ, you are a miracle of restoration in God's eyes. Because before Jesus Christ, you and I had no chance to connect to God. And it turns out that God is inspiring us all the time to connect to people that look like they have no hope. And as we connect to them, we begin to work everyday miracles in their lives. Sometimes we don't see the result of our acts of grace. Oftentimes, we don't understand that God has been working in those really difficult situations long before we showed up. Here at Cornerstone, we have a weekly activity, a ministry, that tries to partner with God to bring about miracles of grace every day. It happens right over here. It's our food pantry. And we made a video to talk about the ways we work with God to make these miracles happen every week. Hi, I'm Pat Moore. Welcome to the food pantry. I'm a member of the 24-7 committee of our church, and today we'd like to feature the food pantry. Our theme for the year is our legacy, our history, and serving our community. And we certainly do that through our food pantry. I'd like to introduce you now to the person who heads it all, Terry Mendenhall. Um, hi, I'm Terry Mendenhall, and I head up the food pantry. I have a lot of staff that helps me, so I don't want to say that I run it. I want to let you know how it works. Okay, um, on Mondays, we go to a place called Caring and Sharing, and we get our bread, our produce, um, that kind of thing. On Wednesdays is our is our day for the for the customers. So they come in, they sign in, fill out their form, pick their produce, pick their bread. Then they come to this door. We give them uh, a bag of food, and then twice a month we give meat, and we give toilet paper out and personal products. If we have anything left over, we supply to a food pantry in Forestell. There's one in uh, North St. Charles that we give. And we also help the backpack out, food drives. We have four of them. We have, the main one is the Boy Scout drive. And we usually get between 25 and 35 piece, uh, thousand pieces. Then we also have the postal drive and shop out hunger. And then we have April Showers, which is the personals. Um, our main one is the Boy Scout Drive that we get all our items through. And then, of course, during the year, we also ask for items from the, the congregation if we're low on stuff. So to find out the history of the 
food pantry, we'd like to introduce Nancy Harrius. In May of 1993, my husband George Crozier and I were in the church office. Dallas Sermon was the church secretary and she said, I can't leave my desk all the time to go downstairs to get food for people that come in asking for food. George and I went downstairs and found that the food was a closet. We called the trustees to see if the room outside the closet was available, and it was. And we asked Dallas, how can we get some shelves in this room? She said Harold Runyon would love to do that. So we called Harold and he came over to the church office and I said, Harold, how much would it cost to put shelves up in this room? And he said about $80. So George and I opened our wallets and came up with almost $80. And Dallas had enough in the petty cash so that he could go get the wood to put the shelves up in that room. Then we put a notice in the paper that at that time it was called Williams Memorial Church. Food pantry was open. And for the last 26 years, we have reached out to the community and fed those in need. And I'm very proud of my church for doing that. So sometimes the work of God and the miracles that can lead from us saying yes to God begin with us giving $80 to God and building a few shelves. What happens is that we give when God asks us to, not really knowing what will happen. And before we know it, more is done than we ever expected. When Simon Peter finished seeing this strange vision of foods he wasn't supposed to eat, animals he wasn't supposed to, to eat, standing in front of him. When he finished with that vision, someone from another town, people who weren't Jews, knocked on his door and said, we need to have you come over and talk to us about Jesus Christ. Simon Peter should have said to them, no, I'm not in the business of talking to people who aren't Jews. Maybe Nancy Harris uh, who uh, maybe she should have 26 years ago said, no, Dallas Sermon, I don't want to give almost $80 to shelving. There's got to be a cheaper price somewhere. Let's wait until next week to worry about this project. You know? Maybe someone else will take it on. I mean, it's just a closet. What good can it do anyway? But instead of doing that, Nancy said, yes, I will do whatever I can to move us from a disorganized closet to advertising in the local paper that we've got a food pantry for people in need. Simon Peter didn't say, I don't want to talk to people who aren't just like me. He went to people who he thought would never encounter God and preached to them, and the Spirit of God brought them into the family of God. You and I are called each day to be involved in God's work. Some of those work projects God is doing look too difficult to really be successful but it turns out God isn't deterred by hard work. And you are created to join God in that difficult work. There have been projects here at Cornerstone that maybe you have said, no, I can't do that because I don't want to give my time or it doesn't seem exciting to me, I don't believe it's important, or I don't even believe God's involved in it. For example... Maybe this is the day for you to go to Sign Up Central after church and say, I'll learn how to make coffee, just like Yvonne Beasley did today. She doesn't know how to make coffee. She made coffee today. Yvonne Beasley has been a cornerstone of our, one of many of you, a cornerstone in our kitchen, and yet she has never made coffee before. Miracles happen every day. <laughs> yes. All right, now let me tell you how I am. Sometimes I get busy in life. My, my arms go like this. I'm like, I'm done. You know? I'm like, I am done. I've had enough. All right? Four funerals, five funerals. I've had enough. Sunday shows up every week. I can't believe it. Got to preach every week. Someone said to me yesterday, how do you do this? I'm like, oh, I don't know. It just happens every week. So. <laughs> no, I say that. Relax yourself for a second. 
Take the tongue off the roof of your mouth. Take a deep breath. Unfold your arms. Turn your hands upward and say to God, where are you working next? God, where can I be a part of the next miracle? $80. A few shelves. A little advertisement in the newspaper. 26 years later, we continue to impact the lives of those in greatest need. Where does God begin with the basic needs we have? This morning, you and I have to understand the restoration work God is doing in you is happening in those around you who you don't think God is working with. Fifth idea. We can, join, we can either join God in spiritual restorations going on all around us, or we can choose to miss out on blessings. There are so many ways to miss out on blessings, right? We can say, I am too tired to go to church today. There'll be another Sunday. We can say, I do not want to give an extra dollar a week to that food pantry ministry because I can use that dollar to buy a soda at McDonald's. I am too busy to help out one Sunday out of the year to learn how to make coffee because I don't drink it nasty stuff anyway. I'm tired of listening to the pastor talk about coffee. Or, or, we can open ourselves up and just simply say to God, open my heart. What's next? How can I be blessed, God, by blessing someone else? These flowers are in a memory of Erla Lovelace. She went to second service. Many of you did not connect to her because she wasn't a first service person. But many of you do know her, know who she was. Erla was always trying to give to others. One of the things she did was she was an advocate for children in foster care. Yesterday, there was a young woman who has a little bitty baby, and she came up and she told a story about how her father had been arrested for a, a drug possession charge, taken from the home forcefully. She was put into foster care. She thought, no dad, no life, I don't really see a purpose of me living. She was just a, a teenager. Out of the blue, literally in her mind, Erla Lovelace showed up one day, a court-appointed advocate, a volunteer. And she said to this young, young girl, I'm going to help you. How did she help her? She picked the girl up from the foster home she lived in, traveled over to a friend of her father's who had her dog, because her dog was taken from her. She couldn't take her with the dog to foster care. They would take the dog and go play with the dog all day at Erla's house with Erla's dog. How would she help this young girl? She'd, she'd pick her up after school, take her to Panda Express for lunch or late lunch, early dinner. I heard that part. I don't remember what else she said, but I remember I was hungry that yesterday. <laughs> and if she said Erla took her to Panda Express, I said, I wish Erla and I had gone to Panda Express. That would have been great. And then the girl said this, Erla Lovelace saved my life because I didn't have a parent to care for me. I didn't see a purpose in my life. I didn't see a reason to keep going on. And she showed up at just the right time. You and I can either join God in the spiritual restorations we don't even know are going on and be that crucial element. Or we can say, no thanks God, it's too much. Well, I wanna challenge you this week to say yes to what God is doing in your life and in those lives around you. So let's do this together. Uh, this week, as we move about the day, hear these words first. Actually, I think you're right, Holly. Let's go back to that. That's a great idea. The scripture reminds us of what Simon Peter encountered. Now, this is our heritage. This is our legacy. We are here because Simon Peter went to preach to others and realized that the Spirit of God was preaching to people that he never imagined would ever hear God's word. And then he got the rest of the Christian community, the rest of the Christian church to realize we need to go to people who don't, aren't just like us. We need to go to people who aren't of the same faith that we are. They're not Jews. And we need to tell them about Christ. 
because that's how they get opened up to life, to eternal life. And so this is what we'll do this week. How can you join God in the spiritual restorations all around you? One, ask God to reveal to you the things God is working on in you. Where were you aware of the work God intends to be doing in you? So this week, begin by saying, God, what are you doing in my life? How are you restoring me? And then ask yourself, did you know that? When you actually hear God speak to you, maybe it won't be tomorrow, maybe it won't be today, maybe it'll be Friday when you finally hear what God's working in you to do. Then second, look around for opportunities to do good in Jesus' name. As Methodists, we believe that it's important for us to do no harm and to do good. So go do good this week in Jesus' name. Then three, begin joining God in the restoration work in and around you. Don't resist God's efforts to restore you to spiritual wholeness and to assist God in the spiritual restoration that brings others to spiritual wholeness too. The big idea for today is God is in the work of spiritual restoration, restoring you and me and bringing others to that same living, eternal faith in Jesus Christ. Will you pray with me? Help us today, God, to say yes to your restoration, to open us up to whoever you want us to be and whoever you want us to help out. In Christ's name, amen.